it is ground up. The nature of warfare is clearly changing and evolving. Over the years, wars have gotten smaller, are generally not declared, and are even won without a need to fire a single shot or missile. This is understandably alarming everyone, individuals, as well as entities across nations, its government industries, organizations, and academia, in short, referred to as NGIOA. There are clear and visible signs that technology is reshaping the way wars are fought in cyberspace, geospace, and space, short referred to as CGS. In a world that is increasingly depending on technology, as the nature of warfare evolves and become high tech, so does the dividing sovereignty lines blurring across cyberspace, geospace, and space. Now, irrespective of cyberspace, geospace, and space today, wars are simply happening when individuals, groups, or nation states armed with advanced information, communication, and other powerful technologies create the conditions for hybrid warfare to achieve their strategic objectives. This vicious technology-driven power struggle raging on in cyberspace, geospace, and space, these new connected CGS battleground are full of unknowns, including major players, minor players, rules of war, and reasons for war. In this connected CGS battlefield, the war casualties have been quietly piling up. It seems everyone, individuals as well as entities across NGIOA are being hit and are at risk of being hit. No one is being spared. As computer core connected computers, internet, and advances in cyberspace, geospace, and space technologies fundamentally transforms warfare, the new reality of connected asymmetric hybrid warfare is causing panic across nation's decision makers. So the question is, how can a nation contain the threats posed by asymmetric hybrid CGS warfare? To discuss asymmetric hybrid warfare further, I'm delighted to welcome Casey Fleming to Risk Roundup. Casey is the CEO of Black Op Partners and is based in the United States. In his previous role, he served as founding managing director of IBM's highly successful cyber division, now known as IBM Security. He regularly advises top leadership of business, government, the military, the White House, and the Congress. He's the co-author of Spectre, the Hybrid Warfare Exercise. The Cybersecurity Excellence Awards recently named him Cybersecurity Professional of the Year. Welcome, Casey. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thanks, Dr. Pandya. I'm uh, honored to be with you today and to share some uh, some new intelligence that we're able to release to the public. So we're, we're excited to be with you today. And again, thank you for the invitation. Wonderful. So the dividing lines of sovereignty in cyberspace, geospace, and space are blurring. The connected CGS battlegrounds bring each NGIO, that means nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, the good, the bad, and the unknown. Now, with the world getting immersed in rapid advances in technology across CGS, that means cyberspace, geospace, and space, the activities in cyberspace have become inseparable from activities in geospace and space. The blurring boundaries of cyberspace with geospace and space has pushed each nation to a significant decision point today as they must continue to defend their current systems and networks in cyberspace, geospace, and space while simultaneously struggle to get out in front of their challengers and competitors in the cyberspace. Part of preparing for warfare is to understand it. Do we effectively understand the ongoing hybrid warfare that is happening across CGS boundaries? The short answer is no, we don't. We as a country, we as a nation, and people don't understand really what asymmetrical hybrid warfare is. It's actually hybrid warfare, but then you have to add asymmetrical on it as well. Um, we do not understand that, and that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm very happy that you invited us to be on the call today or on this webcast today, is to get this intelligence out that we do share with the government um, and that we have an ongoing intelligence program focusing on adversaries, the nation state, and the geopolitical piece of it, to you, which you well described. But the, the short answer is, no, we don't understand, and we must understand it very, very quickly. Yeah, that, that is a good point, and uh, that's a great expansion. But the thing here, what you mentioned about is adversary. Who is adversary here? Is the adversary people, processes, technology, tools, or you know, new systems that are emerging? Because as we see advances in drone technology, artificial intelligence, robotics, 
cyber warfare, militarization of space, and synthetic biology using the CRISPR technology that can manufacture life or bioweapons. Warfare seems to be undergoing fundamental transformation. What is the current state of warfare across cyberspace, geospace, and space? And where do you think we are heading? We're headed into a, a very difficult uh, realm. Uh, cyber warfare is has been kicked off several years ago, uh, and it's the new norm. So it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. Who are the adversaries, you asked? Number one, and just to be very, very frank, it's China. Number two is, a, well, Russia. Number three, Iran, North Korea, and even ISIS is participating in that. And if you really look at it um, all the way through, our, another adversary is ourselves because we don't understand what's going on and we in a lot of cases don't want to understand what's going on. So we're our own adversary uh, with this subject. It's a very complex subject, it's a very serious subject, and it's been going on for many, many years. China has had a nation state program since 1986, month number three, which is program 863. And it, it's a nation state program that says that they will do pretty much anything to be on par and to surpass the West in technology, military, economic, and so on. So it's called program 863 and it's been going on now for over three decades. With cybersecurity and the advent of cyber, cyber came on the, the scene probably in the, the mid nineties when we, we were growing the IBM cyber division. Um, we didn't really think about security at all. All we cared about was redundancy and getting information as quickly as we possibly could to the people that needed it. And, uh, and to do that in a, in a safe, secure, not, a, not in a secure, in a safe, uh, expedient and redundant manner um, and accurate manner. We didn't even think about security. So security has been an afterthought with cyber and it's always been kind of like patching the, you know, with a Band-Aid or a finger in the dike. Uh, and so on. So cyber warfare now, uh, fast forwarding to the conclusion of this uh, webcast, cyber warfare is the key accelerator to over 40 different methods of asymmetrical hybrid warfare. So it's, uh, it's a, we're seeing the adversaries use it as a one to many approach and to accelerate all the other methods to, to make them much more effective than a one to one uh, method. Yes, no, that is a very, you know, good point that you mentioned that, that the technology is, you know, allowing all these adversaries to try to compete, to try to create scenarios or, you know, situations in which they are able to create damage and, you know, for their strategic benefits. Now, scientists can manufacture living organisms using the CRISPR technology. It could be new deadly pathogens, new viruses that we just... Uh, they don't know how to deal with at this point. Drones can assassinate individuals who are thousands of miles away by just a remote control. And cyber systems are compromised and cyber attacks are a new norm. So how is technology impacting the nature of warfare in this, especially when we uh, talk about the asymmetric hybrid warfare, what role existing and emerging technology plays here in this uh, very complex hybrid warfare? Well, our world is changing dramatically. Um, you know, Uber is, a, is really just a software company. They don't own any cars. They don't own any drivers. Uh, but it's the top number one taxi service in America. Uh, so it's completely disrupted the, uh, the, the taxi uh, industry. Same with Airbnb. Uh, they're the largest hotel chain or hotel operator, but they don't own any rooms, another software company. So there's a lot of different things. Car companies, the uh, the recent CEO of, uh, or the CEO, current CEO of uh, Daimler-Benz, which is Mercedes-Benz, said that his main competitors now, primary competitors, are not car companies. They are uh, uh, Tesla. It's a you know car company, but uh, different flavor. But the other ones are Amazon, Google, and uh and a couple others. So the focus now for, and then his big com uh, competitor that he's looking at are those guys as opposed to the traditional car company. So, so all that is based on technology that's changing and it's a significant explosion of technology which will continue. Uh, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. That technology needs to be protected and also the sensitive data that is behind all of this growth and, and powers our economy. It's important to notice and it's important to note that our U.S. economy is based on innovation, has been since, uh, since you know, the Industrial Revolution. And that innovation is now shored up or stored now on 
computer systems and even cell phones, uh, uh, smartphones and so on. So, you know, it's a double edged sword. We're growing like crazy, but at the same time, uh, we're being more exposed, uh, much more exposed at an expo exponential rate. So we can't continue. Uh, along that path, and that's really the purpose of, of this session today is, and this podcast is to create and raise the awareness and the education level on asymmetrical hybrid warfare and kind of create a call to action by everybody who views it. Of course, and you are right about it, that uh, we all are exposed, our data information is exposed, but uh, the reality is that the digital global age, the digitization, information communication, digitization technology, computer core connected computers and internet, it has leveled the playing field. So it is no longer about where the innovation will happen, where the new ideas will have, uh, come from, or uh, where how that innovation is going to disrupt which business or which technology uh, industry or which nation, because uh, now it, it is no longer necessary that the innovators need to be in certain part of the world, Western, you know, to be able to succeed. They could be in any part of the world and they will be able to succeed because the playing field is leveled now. And so the, the competition is coming from anywhere. It doesn't have to be from your own industry. It can come from any industry, from any part of the world. Uh, at the same time, the warfare boundaries are blurring across cyberspace, geospace, and space. And we have reached a point where anyone across the nation can get access to all kinds of weapons. These weapons used to be the exclusive territory of nation states so far, but now the, there is a democratization of, you know, access. Anybody can access the cyber weapons or other weapons in the computer code. We have reached a point where, you know, a really smart computer scientist can write this, you know, code, DNA uh, code of uh, and create a new species, a new organism. A scientist, a really smart scientist, you know, computer scientists can write a code and disrupt our satellites and our space systems. And, uh, you know, they can, uh, using the cyberspace, they can attack the physical, our geospace, our critical infrastructure in uh, geospace. So everything is impacted because of the computer code and connected computers. And that brings a very complex challenge. That, and from your assessment, where do you see the warfare going because of this democratization of war weapons. Uh, that I couldn't have said it better myself, but uh, the answer is, let me go back to the definition of asymmetrical hybrid warfare. It really speaks to the, the smaller or weaker country or adversary using all these different, uh, one or many of all of these different hybrid warfare methods, asymmetrical hybrid warfare methods. And it's to gain advantage and to gain, um, well, basically economic and military and all types of advantage over their adversary, which is much larger and more dominant. Uh, I'll show you some slides a little bit later on in our discussion that'll, that'll, uh, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll shock you uh, as to what's really going on behind the scenes and so on. And, it, and so really the answer is I see it getting much worse because uh, China is by far the, uh, the most advanced at asymmetrical hybrid warfare. They steal uh, an estimated $5 trillion a year in total value out of the U.S. economy, which is a third of our GDP. And if you're stealing, if, if someone is stealing a third of your GDP, by definition, you're at war, whether you like it or not. Um, so that's really the, uh, the umbrella statement or premise that, that uh, I'd like to continue on. So with that, it kind of, you know, it, so that affects every American and really every citizen of a Western economy, any one of our allies and so on, because that's really who is it, uh, who's being targeted. It's really the U.S. And whoever has the innovation, whoever has the um, which innovation is military secrets, as you mentioned, military weapons, it's everything. It's cancer drugs, it's computer chips, it's paint technology, it's uh, um, people's personal identification and so on. All of that is, is to be used, number one, to grow the adversary's economy and their military. The ultimate goal of asymmetrical hybrid warfare is, is to use all the different methods of hybrid warfare to subdue your adversary, that would be us, um, the United States and our allies to subdue us without fighting and without doing conventional warfare. In fact, the Chinese believe that if they have to go to conventional warfare, that they have failed in all the other 40 plus methods of hybrid warfare. So, and, uh, and experts will tell you 
that uh, they still follow the uh, the doctrine of Sun Tzu. And one of his things is, uh, one of his mantras is uh, death by a thousand cuts. So with the United States, it's more of economic death um, and cultural death and all the different methods of asymmetrical death by a thousand cuts. Experts will tell you that China, they're estimated that China's 750 cuts in to death of America economically and so on. I hate... I, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist um, because that is definitely not. I, if you Google anything that I'm telling you here, it is completely documented throughout the, the Internet and government and so on. The issue is nobody's connected the dots. And with our government changing every four years and rotating and having a revolving door on that, it's difficult for them to get their heads around it and hands around it. Our military typically fights the next war with last year's techno I mean last war's technology. So this current war is is everything but conventional. Even though it, you know, our conventional warfare and our conventional military is uh, doing a great job at conventional, this whole warfare asymmetrical is everything but um, it, it, everything but and not to the exception, but that's the last phase. If your asymmetrical is failing, the last phase is absolutely to do conventional. But um, when you when you understand what asymmetrical is, it's it's pretty hard to fail at you know forty other methods of asymmetrical and and forcing a uh, an adversary to go to um, conventional. Thank so you. What do you think is necessary to combat this uh, asymmetric hybrid warfare that is already going on across nations? Well, the the first thing I I can say is uh, let me raise a question. Um, here's here's what keeps me grounded in looking at this. My question is to to anybody out there running an organization, business, military, academia, government agency, is how can you have a cybersecurity strategy if you don't know who your adversary is, what they want, and how they're coming after you, and how they're morphing to it. So today, very few organizations can answer that question accurately. Um, because they don't have the adversary intelligence. How do you know the, who the adversary is? Because the innovations, the ideas to you know create new way of doing things, new systems, can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be any specific country. Well, that's true. So the, you, there are different classes of adversaries. One is nation states and what their what their uh, objective is. Uh, with China, it's number one to grow their economy. Number two is to be the military powerhouse and to make and to make the United States succumb to China in the very near future and basically reverse roles and be a supplier to China. That's the entire goal of China is to completely uh, reverse roles with the two nations, where we are a supporting subservient nation to China. With Russia, it's not as uh, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but why would you know? Uh Anybody, any country or any nation think that, you know, they'll be able to have another country succumb to that because the brain power is not, if you see the biggest brain power is in United States. The new ideas, the new way of doing things, irrespective of what industry or what sector you are looking at, is, you know, in United States, yes, of course, China has developed a lot of strength as far as artificial intelligence goes. And that is a cause of concern that they are, you know, a little bit probably some reports say that they are ahead of United States as far as, you know, the artificial intelligence goes. But it will, time will tell whether they are actually ahead or not. Because, they're, uh, you know, people may think that, you know, they are ahead. But uh, I strongly feel that the strongest brain power is still in the United States. And that is not just, you know, my subjective opinion that it, it, it is based on the innovations, the new ideas and the new uh, initiatives and new companies that are emerging, new systems that are emerging, new way of doing things that is emerging in, in the United States. Now, there are a lot of, you know, reports that, you know, good, you know, ideas and innovations uh, also come from, you know, countries like India. And I, I read a report that it was very disturbing that, I think almost $30 million were invested in one startup and that startup miserably failed in India. So it is, it's not just about having a good idea or, you know, coming up with an innovation, but to succeed to in that innovation, to commercialize it and make it a market reality, make it a competing force requires so many other, you know, variables, which, you know, countries like China and India are not very successful. China is successful in Alibaba. 
but other than that if you see we haven't seen those kind of big you know uh, initiatives or big companies becoming successful so that that you know again you know comes that you know in a, we need lot more variables and lot more components in a nation to function you know effectively to be able to bring the idea and succeed they may still you know countries may still our you know based on the hacking they may still you know ideas they may still the blueprints business plans but to actually make that effective and to create something out of it that's a whole another story you make a very good point and you're absolutely correct but we actually have taught them how to do that for the last 30 years we've been putting plants and uh expert manufacturing in china and they've been very gracious to accept all of our technology and all of our best practices on bringing things to market so remember we're losing a third of our gdp every year in total value it's it the raw number is the research and development that is stolen is 500 billion a year but you have to multiply that uh of the total value in other words the 10 years that that uh, research and development was meant to power the country or the the company uh the military or a government agency so every year we lose 500 billion and again you multiply that by the 10 years that's 5 trillion and that's how that number is is uh arrived at um but we've taught the chinese how to to uh decimate us and i i hate to sound like doom and gloom but when you see somebody said how do you sleep at night casey after you you know all this stuff and and uh it is a lot of doom and gloom and i see intelligence coming across my desk every hour of every day 7 days a week and when you see it it's like being an er doctor you see so much uh uh doom and gloom in an, in an emergency room that you kind of get used to it so um what i see and what our executives see and our research team and intelligence group and our board of directors see on an hourly basis will absolutely shock you i'll i'll show you some slides a little bit later on then i'll show you uh, exactly what's going on so the answer is um uh, you're right the us is still a great innovation powerhouse but let me let me also shore that up with number one china and you can google this China has 25% ownership in uh, uh they have ownership in 25% of Silicon Valley startups and the reason for that is to steal innovation. Um China has 304,000 student quote spies attending US universities on US educational visas. That's to to infiltrate our universities and our companies and organizations, uh military government while they're being students and so on. Remember China is a communist country run by the military. So by definition, everyone in China is a quasi soldier working for the government and it's their national duty to spy for their country and whatever the country needs and so on. We're very confused thinking that China is a democratic country and they're like us and they want to do and they want to do nice by others. They don't. This is a winner take all strategy. So you're absolutely correct that the innovation the US is still an innovation powerhouse but I would urge you um and the audience to just google uh uh Pudong Island uh image of Pudong Island in 1986 and then 26 the same thing Pudong Island 2016 and that growth and that economy which is second in a uh, second to the United States and business insider says that the economy is bigger than the United States Business Insider is quoted as saying that in 2014 that's all done from a country that's not known to do any research and development any market research and development so they're experts at pirating and they're experts at theft and espionage and so on so those those facts and figures i just roiled off are just a tip of the iceberg as far as what really is going on behind the scenes so what can be done what defense strategies or tools we have on hand for not only individuals but also the entities irrespective of what component of a nation that means government industries organization and academia like you are saying what what can be done uh, what is at our disposal to defend ourselves okay the first thing is everybody needs to raise their own personal awareness as to what's going on remember i'm i i was very clear and i said that we are at war we are in a full blown economic war um and i'll show you the different flavors of it of asymmetrical so when you're at war you think and you act very differently 
And so if you remember back in World War II in the United States, there was Rosie the Riveter and Bletchley Park and so on, and it really was a culture change. So the way that we handle data and we handle sensitive information and innovation and so on is a cultural change. Um, today, IT is not, is not the answer. Uh, you know, the average enterprise has 85 cybersecurity products installed and they are protected less than 5%. Uh, cybersecurity is a human problem. It's 95% a human problem. 95% of all data breaches involve some type of human intervention. So it's a human problem. Incidentally, software, hardware, and networks that they, that they comprise are all manufactured and created by humans. They're, they're uh, configured by humans and they're managed by humans. So when you look at it, it's all, uh, you know, our data is created by humans, but it's stored in human uh, uh, built technologies. A big problem we have in government agencies and any organization is that we feel, we still feel that uh, cybersecurity is an IT problem, and it is not. Cybersecurity is a, is a senior leadership problem, and it's a culture issue that we have to change the way, or we have to change our relationship with data and sensitive information. So, you know, when we go on to Wi-Fi, most people don't realize that it's a public Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi, all of your information on your smartphone is now available to everybody on that free Wi-Fi network or accessible. So if you're going through that grocery store or coffee shop or aircraft or airport or wherever it is or hotel, our adversaries can be logged into that network from Beijing or from Tehran um, or North Korea or ISIS or whatever. And they can be logged in for, and they, and so everything on your phone, every password, every account number, every email, every text, every photograph on your smartphone is now accessible and downloaded by your adversary. So we have to change our relationship with data and that's a cultural change. So you asked what tools do we have? We actually help design a tool called Spectre. It's a, it's an exercise. We teach you asymmetrical hybrid warfare. We teach you, um, we train you in their methods. So it's their strategy of asymmetrical and it raises your awareness as an executive or as a middle manager, makes you much more uh, efficient at, to your own personal wealth as far as a career, but really your value back to the organization. So we, uh, what it is, it's a five day exercise. We, we uh, assign two attack teams and two defense teams it's based on uh, martial arts strategy and martial arts warfare because that's what asymmetrical hybrid is warfare is based on. And so there's two attack teams, two defense teams. Halfway through, we switch. And, uh, and so it's, it's an experiential exercise that we created because death by PowerPoints doesn't really work. Sitting behind, you know, for three days or four days of PowerPoints, you'll retain probably five, if you're really good, 10% if it's an interesting subject experiential training and basically putting you in the fight makes you left brain, right brain, and it, it makes it much more applicable for retention and for use back in the organization. Also, you back with your family uh, at the coffee shop, at the restaurant, and so on. So it's, uh, it's an awareness uh, that needs to happen. It's an education, and it's a cultural change. If you think back in the 80s when we did sexual harassment training, that was a cultural change. And then uh, in the 90s, we had to do diversity training. That was a cultural change. And our relationship now with sensitive data and innovation, it's wartime and we have to protect that. And so that is a cultural change that has to be driven at the very, very top. It is not an IT issue. IT. Sure. Uh, I, I, I agree with you in that it's not just IT issue. Secu so far, people were also thinking that security is a government problem. It's no longer a government problem. It is everyone's problem. That's why we say that individuals and entities across nations and its government industries, organizations, and academia, everyone has to get involved. Everyone has to, you know, take part in the security. So you just talked about the specter, you know, the tool that your organization has developed. Would you like to demonstrate that by giving examples of uh, some asymmetric warfare that has concerned you and your organization? Uh, I'd be happy to. Let me. Uh... Let me give you a couple of slides here. Let me get to the slide first. I'm going to show you the uh, the money slide. Okay, that's this is the slide that uh, will ground you in what's going on. Okay, sure. can you see it now? Yes. 
Okay, this is really, this is, uh, this is a single slide that shows, you know, if, if you want to know about asymmetric hybrid warfare, what it means to you and how big it is and so on, you can see, number one, it, it says that the modern battlefield is everywhere. And that's just as to what you explained previously. Um, it's everywhere. It's cyberspace, it's geospace, it's everywhere. It's really the new global competitive model. When China buys 25% interest or 20, interest in 25% of Silicon Valley's startups and taking companies, uh, buying a lot of companies, hotel chains, uh, uh, insurance companies, uh, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, it's for espionage. It's for espionage to steal innovation to power their economy and to know how you fight and so on. You noticed back in the day, I'm sorry, a year ago, there was an OPM breach. That was the, uh, the Office of Personnel Management breach. They breached 26 million uh, government, military, CIA records with all the personal data, uh, psychological records, fingerprints, everything. Uh, that was breached. And in fact, that breach is still going on today in the dark net. Um, uh, so the issue with that is, is that that information was also used on a U.S. platform, a U.S. software modeling platform to model every U.S. citizen on their access to innovation, who they're connected to, how they can get to innovation. And, you know, if they got missed, I mean, China has a shopping list of missing items that they need for, uh, certain innovation, certain technologies. Um, so this is really the new global competitive model. So we're operating out of a 1990s playbook uh, in the United States with our, our global uh, 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 presence, but uh, our adversary, China, is working off a 2050 playbook. And I'll, I'll segue just, or I'll pause right here for a, a little bit. Again, I, we're talking a lot about China because they are the most advanced, the most uh, disciplined, and the most effective, and they've been doing it for three decades, since 1986. Um, so a lot of focus is on China, and they, they really do dictate the strategy of asymmetric hybrid warfare. But it's also important to note that Russia also plays in about six or seven of these asymmetrical methods. Uh, Iran does, uh, North Korea, and yes, even India is starting to play in some of these as well. Uh, there are currently over 30 nations that have cyber warfare capability, and that's up from probably 12 about three years ago. So cyber warfare in this slide shows that it's the center, it's the nucleus that, that accelerates all these other different type of methods. And uh, just for example, I'll give you one example, drug warfare. Uh, you, any American citizen can order uh, illegal drugs uh, for example, uh, MDN, MDNA, which is Molly, Ecstasy, uh, uh, GHB, Rufinol, and uh, Carfentanil, and Fentanyl, all these can be ordered from China. Uh, and they can be on your doorstep or your teenager or your brother's doorstep in three weeks. Um, uh, China also supplies raw materials, raw chemicals to the Mexican drug cartels in containers uh, to infiltrate and destabilize America from the inside from a whole drug piece of it. One other thing on the drug piece, uh, Upjohn had uh, a patent, filed a patent for a product called U for Upjohn 47700 back in 1979. It's seven times, 7.5 times more powerful than morphine and it's 7.5 times more addictive than morphine. The FDA says, no, the morphine's all we need. And so the patent sat in the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, which is searchable by the Internet, which is searchable by the Chinese. You can buy U47700 now from China, which was illegal and never produced in the United States. And it will be on your doorstep in three weeks. So all methods of asymmetrical hybrid warfare that you're seeing here are, uh, are meant by the adversary to destabilize and, and for the, the country, the target country, to lose to lose control and so on. So there's a lot of what's going on. I won't go into a lot of detail here, but asymmetrical hybrid warfare is also named as anything warfare. One other point, you look on the, the bottom left under non-military, poisoning warfare. Um, not only are these e-cigarettes and vaping units have a USB charger, which when you plug it into your computer, downloads malware so they can track, so they, they can access your computer and all the data on your computer, your camera, your microphone. Um, but they're also manufactured with cadmium, 
cadmium is a is a known serious potent car carcinogen uh, carcinogenic metal um, and on top of that uh, the fluids that you inhale have formaldehyde um, uh, so the transport mechanism for a lot of those uh, vaping fluids or vaping liquids is formaldehyde another one uh, from poisoning piece of it is uh, you can look up lumber liquidators. A lot of flooring that uh, lumber liquidators had in, uh, that they, they imported was from China, and China cured it with formaldehyde. So that's seeping into your house and into your families um, all day, all night, 365 days a year of this formaldehyde in flooring and so on. So all this stuff is Google uh, is on Google, searchable and so on, but nobody's ever connected the dots to really say this is what the total strategy is. Uh, back to you. Sure. Now, what you're saying, you know, I, I understand the complex challenges that you're talking about and all these investments that's pouring in, you know, in our uh, startups and uh, from all over the world, uh, those, you know, policy decisions, we will have to address, you know, what should be, you know, acceptable, what should not be acceptable. But the level, playing field has changed, you know, the boundaries are, you know, disappearing between, you know, nations. The cyberspace, geospace, space, everything, you know, the, the branches are blurring. So it, it does not matter where the innovation is happening. A idea could be somewhere. Innovation could be happening somewhere. Uh, investments could be coming from somewhere. And the commercialization manufacturing could be happening somewhere else. So this, this is a whole different game that we will have to understand how to effectively manage the complex challenges, you know, in this very complex, very diverse scenarios. Now, another factor is that by the year 2020, it said that over 50 billion machine to machine devices, IOTs, you know, will be connected to cyberspace through the embedding of computer sensors and internet capabilities. Everything that is connected to internet, smart homes, smart enterprises, smart cars, everything, it all is a target and a war zone. So the question is, who will we defend? What will we defend? And how will we defend when the play, the attack surface area is broadening, widening so rapidly? So it's about, again, it's about awareness and education. And our government needs to put requirements on that IoT expansion because every IoT, every IoT device now, which is minimal on the security side, is a spying device. It's a spying mechanism for every IoT device. Um, China just bought, uh, or about a year ago, bought uh, General Electric's uh, appliance division, which is a heavy IoT division. So these are these are all things that we have to consider as a country and as every American. But it's about awareness and about education, and that's why we're committed to uh, to help get the word out. Let me give you another slide. This will this will put it more into perspective. These are just examples of high order espionage examples that are going on while we sleep, while we work, and so on. We we mentioned free Wi-Fi. We call it Wi Spy. Your home Wi-Fi, if you don't have it locked down, every email that you send on your smartphone or on your computer at home, even doing work at home and so on, if it's not locked down with a powerful password, it's going, it's going out to, uh, you can imagine where. Smartphones, I mean, you can pick any one of these things. These are all target methods, methods and target platforms uh, used by our adversaries. Um, and this is very, very serious. I mean, there's uh, honeypots, that's, uh, you know, uh, Honeypot is a uh, blackmail system uh, used by adversaries to to compromise you for information or innovation or access or passwords and so on. So sure. all of these are different methods. Uh, these are not these are certainly not all the methods, but these are the major methods that um, that our adversaries are using against us. And it's to grow their economies, grow their power, grow their military, and weaken the United States. It is a, it is a very complex challenge. And now, when we you talked about the technology, Wi-Fi and other technologies, uh, as we were talking about IoTs, uh, when we evaluate the role of technology in hybrid warfare, how does hybrid cyberspace, geospace, space warfare use a growing array of cyber technologies? Like we just talked about IoTs, but then wearables, the electronics, the internet, social media cyber tools and so many other digital devices that are popping up to create 
new vulnerabilities and advantages against an adaptive enemy. So uh, the technology has changed the uh, whole warfare grounds, you know, to fund it has fundamentally transformed it because now, you know, each and every equipment, each and every uh, thing that is connected to internet is, you know, at a warfare, you know, tool. And uh, we we have to, you know, all the variables, jewelry is coming now. Then we also have uh, probably, you know, the medical implants that we have in medical devices. You know, there's uh, all these uh, uh, implants that, you know, medicine and healthcare sector has that also are, you know, a fair game in the, according to, you know, some of these warfare, uh, uh, you know, countries or warfare, you know, groups or uh, terrorists or someone who wants to do damage. So everything, you know, is a, a open, you know, battleground for so many of these uh, uh, hackers or, you know, nation states or groups that are trying to damage. So how are we going to create uh, how these new vulnerabilities and advantages from your assessment are being used against an adaptive enemy? Um, could you restate the question? I, yeah, I The connection broke up. Sure. So when we evaluate the role of technology in hybrid warfare, how does the hybrid CGS warfare use a growing area of cyber technologies like wearables and inter Internet of Things and uh, social media and cyber tools and digital devices to create new vulnerabilities and advantages against an adaptive enemy? They, well, when there are advantages for our adversaries, there are also advantages for us, for the United States and our allies. Um, so, so it's it's a it's a two-edged sword that cuts both ways. So, if we want to be offensive, we certainly could be. But right now, it's against the law to be offensive to to anyone. Um, uh, it's against U.S. law to do that. That may change at some point in the future. Um, but what we need to do when we create these technologies and when they are being developed, there needs to be a security plan around it. There needs to be, you know, with, whether it's encryption, whether it's access, whatever it is, there needs to be a master plan because in the past, it's never thought of that. Now, a lot of these IP, internet protocol, uh, wireless cameras that are out there that are monitoring babies or intersections or bank lobbies or your, ha your home or your business, a lot of those IP cameras were created in uh, in the early stages, which, by the way, up until now, have very minimal or if any security uh, on these things. So we have to when we and we're the creators of this innovation, as you mentioned earlier. We need to hold uh, hold the line and require that when you're developing these things, they need to have a, a very strong security contingent on that as well. And it's really a uh, it's a 360 degree view because. You know, you have to look at things, um, how they can be hacked. You know, creating things with a security uh, 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 package or a security framework in mind is one thing, but that it's very different. And what I'm describing is a total transformation because what we've done in the past, which is 99% of organizations, is we look at it from a perimeter perspective. This is what we have that we want to protect. You have to look at it from your adversary's perspective. This is what they want. This is what we want as an adversary, how we're going after it and, and how we're morphing to go after it and so on. Um, so there's an ethical hacking piece of it. There's the dark net piece of it. You really have to look at this thing from a 360 degree perspective. So our government needs to, to get involved and to, to to coordinate this, but then every every organization and every individual. If, and again, I'm I'm going to harken back to World War II or you know a major world war. You know when you're at war, everybody gets involved and everybody has a role, and uh, and it's and they have an obligation and a duty, and that's where we are today. And again, that's that's the purpose of uh, of uh, you and I getting together. Yes, of course, everyone has a role to play. We all need to be accountable. This is a hyper-connected world, producing increasingly adaptive and technologically savvy hybrid threats, which are very, very complex even to understand or to identify. So to remain competitive, the nations must vigorously pursue new concepts, new way of doing things, which correctly assembles emerging technology and new capabilities into uh, you know, some trusted fields of practice or you know, industries or a way of doing things. So, how do entities across NGIOs stay competitive while fighting warfare? Because 
on one side they have to manage their vulnerabilities they have to secure their uh, uh, wherever they feel that security vulnerabilities are they have to manage the risk and at the same time they also have to stay competitive and you know progress and advance and uh, create sustainable initiatives sustainable uh, businesses and industries so how, it's a very complex challenge how do they do that uh, it's it's a fine line because companies uh, companies and organizations in the past have wanted to put their heads in the sand and say that's an IT problem that I you know it's cyber it's IT we don't understand it just let those guys handle it but when from a from a business perspective when a data breach can kill your company they can shoot they can nail your stock price um, in a matter stock price financial value um, of the company, uh, the brand reputation, which is in a lot of cases even more important. Um, you know, brands are developed over decades or you know, centuries in some cases, and they can be gone in a matter of hours because of a data breach. So it's, it's again, I'm gonna harken back to awareness, education, and a call to action by all parties, by every, every individual, every organization, and so on. One thing I'd like everybody to realize is that when you hear of a data breach, you know, most of us think, that, well, you know, that's unfortunate for company A or uh, the OPM data breach or the White House data breach or the IRS data breach. You know, that's, that's sad, it's unfortunate, um, but what time is dinner? And, uh, you know, when's the golf game? I want everybody to understand when you hear of a data breach, that's only about 10%. Only 10% of data breaches get reported. But every time you hear of that data breach, realize that there's 10 times as many of data breaches and realize that every time you hear of a data breach, a chunk of the American dream for you, your family, your, grand, your children and grandchildren is gone forever. And that's for nation state adversaries. Hackers just want to make money. They want to make a quick buck right now. So that's what they're looking for. They want to turn some information and get paid for it. Uh, some of them want to destroy now. We've seen malware now go and ransomware now go to actually destroying computer systems and databases and uh, and so on. So, And we forecasted that about a year ago that it would be going here and so on. So this is the new norm. It's not going away and it's it's forcing everybody to, to play the game. I, I and Black Ops today wanted to get this message out to everyone because we, we made it our business to go in and find out really what was going on from an intelligence perspective. And that's why we advise government agencies and uh, companies and, uh, and other, other governments uh, that are our Western allies. So it's, it's that important that we all realize what's going on. But again, uh, I hearken back to awareness, education, and uh, a call to action. It is a culture change. So the next time you log in and you say, wow, why, you know, and it, it, we got a lot of things against us. I mean, all of us are addicted, you know, I mean, I try to, I try to get myself off of it, but you know, listen, I've got, uh, there's free Wi-Fi. Well, let me download to see if I can get rid of some emails or let me see who's going to send me a text and all that. I, I mean, it's, it's we've got a lot of things against us, um, including our own uh, our own ignorance to really what's really going on. So the big picture is out there. We need to be aware of that piece of it. You mentioned earlier, and we talked about and discussed uh, Spectre. Spectre is an exercise where it 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 forces that cultural change. It force you know it's a five day exercise that forces people, and we we jointly created that. This uh, this exercise was created. Uh, for the British government, and it was funded by the British government and went into British military, uh, government, and uh, business, and so on. Uh, we partnered with that company, and now we we actually own this exercise, and we perfected it, and so on. So it's something that we have that we're pretty passionate about, and getting it out to uh, to the masses, to where you're now aware. Uh, it's it, it forces you to look at the 360. Uh, when you're developing a product, when you're going to market, when you're looking at global markets, when you're looking at efficiencies and so on. So it's not uh, a byproduct of it. And a byproduct is you're running much more efficiently as an organization. The bonding and the teamwork being in a sweating type of a, an exercise like this is is extraordinary. So you're able to bond more, your teamwork, it destroys the silos that every organization has because now you're focused on a bigger threat and a bigger issue, which is asymmetrical hybrid warfare. So so it forces uh, the breakdown of silos that that is 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 rampant in every organization that has people, has human beings and so on. It's just uh, it's a normal thing that you really can't get away from. So we're 
we're really uh, we're seeing a lot of success with this exercise to get people uh, to understand and to raise the to, to your point to, to raise the awareness of this whole thing. Yes, I mean that is that, that is the most critical you know need right now that we need to raise we need to create education and awareness so that we can change our thought process, we can change our thinking in how to you know look at the vulnerabilities, how to look at risk and how to manage our risk and how to play a role, how to be accountable and how to play a role in bringing security to not only our initiatives, our investments or our you know projects, but to you know collectively to our nation also. So and many of these uh, CGS, uh, what you said about the uh, the data breaches, the knowledge that is available that you know how many data breaches have been there is like you said, is only 10%. Most of the breaches, we don't have the public knowledge about it. The dark net, you know, has all the data, but the public doesn't know about all the breaches that are happening. It is not a public knowledge. So yes, you are right that the risk is very critical and all these warfare weapons are so easy to make now and their potential use is unlimited. One doesn't have to be a nation state to do, you know, the, this kind of uh, attacks, cyber attacks. They just have to be really smart. Someone sitting in a, uh, you know, probably a cave in uh, some country with an internet connection and a laptop, they can create a, uh, as much damage as a, you know, regular warfare that can create, you know, because they can destroy systems sitting there. Anyone can make a cyber weapon, bio weapon, nano weapon and so on. So this is a whole new world of unknowns where anyone around you can be an enemy trying to attack you. And that is a really cause of concern. So how, what is the state of current defense that you see across nations? How can anyone protect themselves from these unknowns doing that exercise? What you have the specter and understanding and changing your thought process is one thing, but to be actually able to create defense to, to all these uh, vulnerabilities. How do we do that? Well, you have to, you have to understand your adversary first. And like I, I mentioned, I didn't, I don't think I uh, covered all of them. The, the number one adversary type is uh, the nation state. The number two is privateer or hackers. And then the third one is the hybrid of that, the combined, which nation states are using the privateers. They're, they're outsourcing uh, a lot of their hacking methods into the dark net to provide additional cover and addi additional proxy to what's going on. We run a we run uh, one of the best, most efficient and effective dark net uh, groups uh, on a global basis. So we're aware we've got that 360 of what's going on. You know when they're hacking all the airlines and putting this information out uh, and so on and the, and the, the global banking heist, we advised all the government agencies, the Interpol and everybody on what was going on with, uh, with the global banking heist, um, which was perpetrated by a Chinese APT. And then once they got access into the Mexican financial system, uh, they uh, kicked that vulnerability back out to the dark net to kind of throw the dogs off the scent, and that was picked up by other people in another country. So, you know, we see this whole kind of 360 thing going on, We and that's really what intelligence is. Um, so those are, your, those are your adversarial types, those three types, the combined being the third. And the other one is, uh, uh, the other thing to look at is, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, we all understand who those people are and who those adversaries are and have a plan with that. But really it goes back to the awareness, the education, which this starts. I mean, I'm happy to share these slides with your, uh, with your audience today. This is really, uh, uh, what, you know, the, the, the next step. And so when you really absorb really what, who the adversaries are and you look at it from their glasses, then you're able to, to say, wow, we are looking at this whole risk management thing wrong wrongly, and we're looking at uh, cybersecurity wrongly, and so on. I, you can quote me, cybersecurity is fundamentally broken. Um, the industry is expected to be $1 trillion, forecast to be $1 trillion by 2021. So the four years up to that are about $250 billion a year averaging. So $1 trillion industry. And the last time I looked, the Bellwether foundational stock, uh, you know, kind of indicating the health of the industry is FireEye, and it was trading at half, the last time I checked, it was trading at half of its IPO value. Um, so that tells you what's really going on with the health of the industry. So what, I'm, what I am absolutely pontificating 
is that we do a 180 degree cultural transformation with how we handle data, how we a, 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 a cyber a 180 degree cybersecurity uh, transformation, and a 180 degree uh, risk management uh, uh, transformation. Because once you understand your adversary and you understand the big picture, it everything comes into focus. Uh, because right now all we're doing is we're 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 all busy. We are all busy. But we're all busy doing the wrong things. Um, I, and I hear your point on that. And cybersecurity is a complex challenge. It is not something simple that any technology or tool can manage it. Because hybrid warfare is more than just technology. It is human and non-human intelligence, processes, and so much more. The battlefield, the CGS battlefield, stands to be fundamentally altered by the technology evolution and revolution at both the strategic and the tactical levels across you know cyberspace geospace space so when you conduct these exercises with the, these decision makers from across nations do they understand the full reality of these changes that are happening across nations it's it's actually fun and rewarding to watch them go through the the doorway you know they're going through several different doorways or several different gates number one you, you you know, this whole subject, and I know that your viewers are thinking, wow, this is very serious. This is very serious stuff. This is conspiracy theory, theory stuff. And I'm assuring you, it is not. Um, I am not a conspiracy theorist. But so it's, it's when you when they initially understand uh, that they have a problem and we and that we all do because we're at war and they sign up for the exercise. They don't know what they're really getting into. They have an idea, but they don't know what they're really getting into. After the first day, there's kind of an awakening. After the second day, there's uh, there's an empowerment. After the third day, that's when you switch teams. And then now, now you understand it really well. And you're saying, wow, this is really what's going on with my organization. This is really what's going on with my nation state, with from these other nation states. And now you think much more effectively as a leader or a department manager or whatever. Usually we go in at this in a private in the private sector, we usually go in at the C-level. We grab the C-levels. Sometimes we do boards of directors first, and then we do it through the organization. Um, and in government agencies, we usually do it with uh, the agency director and his direct reports or her direct reports at that time. But it's interesting to see the transformation, not to overuse the term, of, of you know the experience where it's an awakening and they say, wow. And uh, the comments we get back is, is that it's the best exercise or best thing they've ever done in their career. Um, and uh, senior executives uh, come back and say, and boards of directors say, this is, this is really, really uh, effective and efficient, and it gets everybody on the same team. So it, it trains, educates, and makes people aware, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're practicing defense methods, and you're also memorizing and knowing attack methods of what your adversaries are using. Um, so we're not, we're not, we're not uh, professing to use attack methods, we're, we want you to be proficient in ta attack methods to understand what they are, how they're coming, so you can defend and use your defense methods accordingly. Sure. No, I, that's a that's a good point that you make there. The question for hybrid cyberspace, geospace, space warfare is how do we assemble the pieces of warfare into a security framework that provides a culturally compatible mission-specific blueprint for individuals and entities across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, security across cyberspace, geospace, and space. We need an in integrated CGS security framework. We need everyone to be accountable. We need to create a framework where we allow the independent risk that any enterprise or any entity can manage on their own. But when they come across a risk that is interconnected, interdependent, then we need a framework in which we can uh, scale those risks so that everyone get, you know, is aware of uh, the risks that are emerging that have interconnected as interdependencies. But we don't see that kind of framework across nations. We don't see the risk management you know, framework that needs to be there to get an effective, you know, way of managing security risk. We just don't see that. And uh, that is the biggest challenge. NIST has, you know, uh, issued guidelines and about the cybersecurity risk management framework, uh, framework, so they say for the critical infrastructure. But there, there is no foundation, no fundamentals there 
to manage interconnected and interdependent risk. And that is the biggest challenge I see that, you know, everyone is looking at things in silo. And while, you know, we, we all, the competition, we all welcome competition. We all want to compete in our own ways and succeed and prosper. But at the same time, when this is a very different connected society now, even within a nation, everything is connected. So you know, you know, entities or no enterprises, they can uh, conduct their affairs in that old fashioned way where they think that I get this intelligence, let me just give this intelligence to myself because I'm competing with, you know, other uh, competitors in the industry. That even if we want to maintain the competitive nature of our uh, capitalist econom economic system, but at the same time, we need to have a conscious capitalist uh, you know, system where we think that that if we don't share what we have learned that would hurt the other industries or other competitors, then even though we are not hurt directly, we are going to get hurt indirectly. And that is why we need a framework that allows us to, you know, manage risk effectively, but we don't have that at this point. So let's talk about your organization, Black Hawk Partners. You talked about this uh, Spectre, the exercise that you all have developed uh, from what you are telling me, it looks to be very interesting and impressive. And I hope that our global viewers and listeners that they uh, take a look at that and then they decide for themselves whether that is something uh, that is worth for their time and whether they should go for uh, an exercise like that or a similar exercise so that they can change their outlook, they can understand, ed educate themselves and uh, get informed and get aware because knowledge is power. We all want to be informed of what challenges we are facing in this very complex world. But other than the spectrum, what tools you are using for the hybrid warfare system? Is that your only uh, tool that you use or do you have other tools uh, that, are uh, that you use? That is, a pri that is the primary foundational tool that we use. Um, you know, to your point, uh, there's a lot of people that are busy and they're working in silos. So we don't really, we're not moving forward in cybersecurity or protecting data or moving forward in asymmetrical warfare. And the reason is nobody, very few people, very few people understand the big picture. And this presentation today, this discussion today is the big picture. So when, it, when we continue the awareness and people understand that you're at war and this is how you're at war and how they're coming after you and so on, then you can effectively do those frameworks and people will, people will naturally get on the same page. When I hear of a company says, well, we kind of we kind of advise boards of directors, so we're competitors. I'm thinking, no, we're not. <laughs> I'm like, you know, when you're at war, we're all allies. Okay, so there is no, com there are no competitors, and so on. So, um, that's very well said that you know, when we are at war, we are all allies. This is we need to collaborate, we need to cooperate because we have to protect our systems, our econo economic system, our financial system, all uh, you know, every other system. We need to protect our way of life we need to protect everything that we have developed so far so you are right when we are at war we all need to be allies and and i i hope that everybody listening to this webcast understands that that you know when you're losing a third of your gdp you're at war whether you like it or not um we're not and we're not uh adversaries as Americans and as Western allies, you know, uh, I work with a lot of Australian people, companies, government, uh, same with the UK, Canada, and so on. And we're all allies in this thing together. When you really truly understand what's going on, which the big picture is asymmetrical hybrid warfare. You asked what we do at Black Ops Partners. Um, you know, back in the day, we you know, when Black Ops initially, the reason we started Black Ops was we're, we got tired of taking people's money and not really helping them. And so we were deploying products, cybersecurity products that we knew weren't working properly and covering and, and giving the sense of, of uh, protection that companies really needed. So we ended up being a management consulting company, which were really strategic advisors. Management consulting kind of has a, not, a, not a good connotation. So we're strategic advisors. We're here really to help organizations, the senior leadership of, uh, of the world's largest, largest organizations. Um, and we also do mid-market uh, as well on occasion. So to, the, the, 
So to be able to do that, we had to have a, a critical intelligence loop. And I and I wanted to I want to make sure that everybody's clear on what intelligence. There are many different flavors of intelligence. Today in cybersecurity, people talk about uh, uh, threat intelligence, which is pretty immediate. It's what happened last night or what's happening today. That's threat intelligence. Uh, it's in threat as a, in accordance with the network. Very rarely do we talk about the human factor, the, the threat factor from the human side, which is where it really needs to be. I'm not saying take our foot off the gas with IT. That's my background. Um, but what I'm trying to say is keep your foot on the gas with IT and the technology and all the products and so on. Don't let your foot up. But at the same time, you need to put another foot down on an accelerator, which is the human element. So to do that effectively, you have to have uh, adversary intelligence. So there's threat intelligence, um, there's network intelligence and so on, but it's that all pales in comparison in uh, comparison to adversarial intelligence. You really need to know your adversary's strategies and what they're doing and how they're how they're uh, uh, deploying those strategies. So that's what we're talking about. And when you're able to have that level of intelligence, you're then able to create the proper protection, cybersecurity strategy, risk mitigation plans, and so on. So we focused, we said, wait, you know, what's really going on here? These are not anonymous and uh, random data breaches. Something's going on. So we, we did our own feasibility study. We went into the intelligence side and then we decided we had to have a, a, an intelligence group. We had to grow that. Then we, were, then we understood that we had to have an intelligence network, which we currently have and so on. So um, that's, our, that's our foundation. So if you don't have intelligence, your information that you had yesterday or last week is completely obsolete your, and your product is completely obsolete. Because you're working off intel, you're working off intelligence that was a year ago, a week ago, uh, two years ago, and so on. By the way, cybersecurity products typically cybersecurity products just by definition are obsolete because you have to cut off the development, you have to productize it, you have to build support around it, and so on. And you're already now at least if you're efficient as all get out, you're at least a year behind on on cutting edge. And then, then you have to bring it to market. So you're starting at 12 months, usually it's 18 months out. So, so cybersecurity products by definition are typically uh, 12 to 18 months obsolete at when they hit the market. And then uh, they stay out in the market for quite a period of time. So, it's, so keep that in mind. Again, you're only, our information, our intelligence, our experience in the industry that, that uh, most of us are, have been in, uh, in cyber for, well over 20 something years. Uh, intelligence is absolutely key to keep you relevant and to keep your, your, uh, your knife sharp. So the other piece of it is we've got top experts, multi-domain, we've got experts from the CIA, Secret Service, um, McAfee, IBM, Deloitte. Uh, we've got top cyber law experts that we, uh, that we've, we refer uh, to. Uh, cyber law helps limit, from a risk perspective, cyber law helps limit discovery uh, when there is a breach, so it limits class action lawsuit depth and uh, duration and so on. Um, so it's a very it's a short conversation versus a three month conversation when you're going through discovery and so on. So cyber law is a is a new area. It's a boutique firm that you're looking for. You're not looking for the brick and mortar firm that says, oh yeah, by the way, we do cyber. It's not it's not one of those things you can just get into and build a practice on. You have to have people. Uh, who've been in cyber for many, many years to understand how to create and protect boards of directors and C-level executives from class action lawsuits. And, and the key there is, is to educate, train, as well as uh, limit discovery. Uh, we have, we realized also that this, the, the new wild west in cyber, the growth area in cyber is the dark net. Um, so we've, we've, we've had uh, uh, operatives in the dark net for, the longest period, our people are uh, much uh, very baked in in the internet on a global basis, and they share information. They're always monitoring uh, the dark net and reporting back. When we see a crime happening, it's our duty and it's the law that we report it to law enforcement, which we do. Um, we do extensive research and analysis of all of our intelligence, and then we use breakthrough tools and training. So. 
Uh, Spectre is the key tool. We've got other tools that, uh, based on the requirement of the of the client, we can employ those tools as where I can't as well. I can't get into the detail on those. Those are those are confidential and classified tools. Um, that if we do engage those tools with the client, that they sign strict NDAs to be able to use those. And then we've got consulting services. You know, when we find vulnerabilities in an organization, what we do is we do a thing called uh, cyber second opinion. And, you know, we know that your, your CIO is working his tail off. We know that your CISO is working his or her tail off. We know everybody's working hard, but we have a view. We have a crow's nest view, a tip of the spear view of what's going on because of our intelligence and our team. And we're able to give you a cyber second opinion to kind of make you sharper, better, and so on. And it's and uh, we we help find vulnerabilities at the board level, at the C level, at the agency director level, and so on. And then we can help you implement those through your organization. We are we are not adversarial with your organization. We partner with you. And remember what I said: we're all at war. And so is people and help organizations, whether it's private sector, uh, whether it's government agencies, whether it's military or uh, academia, uh, it's our goal is to, to help you quickly uh, sharpen your spear. Uh, and then what we've been called is uh, we are the tip of the spear of our capabilities. So that's really who we are. And that, that's, uh, uh, that's our one slide on, on what we're all about. Great. So thank you, Casey, for participating in Risk Roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on asymmetric hybrid warfare and the tool that you have developed as Spectre and all the information that you shared about it. Our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you uh, shared about the complex challenges, complex warfare challenges that uh, we all individuals as well as entities across NGIA are facing and its future across in cyberspace, geospace and space. So even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to secure their initiatives and investments and solve the complex asymmetric warfare challenges facing nations based on the understanding they receive from the discussion we had today, this risk round of dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. Thank you. And by the way, one last point. If people are looking for, if your viewers are looking for more information on this subject, uh, our research team posts uh, articles, uh, you know, it's uh, general public media articles. We post that to our company page on LinkedIn. So if, if your readers and viewers are looking for examples and so on, we post them as they happen on our company page on LinkedIn. And Dr. Pena, I'd like to thank you very, very much for the invitation today. I hope your viewers uh, feel it's very, well worth their time and feel free to share this video because it is very, very important uh, that, we, uh, that we raise the awareness to, uh, to everybody, American people and our, our allies. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for sharing that information about your LinkedIn page. And uh, uh, I uh, urge our viewers and listeners all across nations to take a look at uh, uh, this uh, new way of uh, understanding the complex challenges that we are facing. Because the implications of any technology revolution and evolution is not often understood at first. That was true of the tank, the machine gun, the telephone. And it is still true of drones and cyber weapons and nano weapons, bio weapons and space weapons. So it may take time for NGIOA decision makers to realize that inserting new technologies in cyberspace, geospace or space, be it something as simple as information communication and digitization technology to more complex to drones or artificial intelligence or CRISPR, CRISPR technology. The new ways of doing things always creates new inefficiencies, new vulnerabilities and risks. So irrespective of CGS, any new technology revolution and evolution necessitates restructuring of every dimension of variable around it to not only realize the full potential of the technology promise, but also defend from its perils. The challenge is decision makers across NGIOA are very slow to adapt to any change. Even if nations implement a new technology, the ecosystem around it still remains the same, creating failures, inefficiencies, and complications. And this is a cause of serious concern. Risk groups, cybersecurity, geosecurity, and space security risk research centers are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA and CGS. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace, they all walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities. 
as well as management of conflict it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two all three concepts feeding to each other we believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations tradition becomes our security so if we build a culture of managing risk effectively it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace let's manage the existing and emerging risks together for more information on the risk roundups to watch the risk roundup videos or hear the risk roundup podcast please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share until next time i'm jayeshri pandya host of risk roundups signing off see you next time thank you